Thanks for tuning in again to the Brown Bear Vodcast. The big story in comms is the appointment of the new director of communications for number 10, Mr. Gitto Harry. And what a week it's been for Gitto. We found out a heap of things. He shops at Tesco's. He enjoys distributing healthy snacks to his colleagues. He doesn't think his boss is a total clown, but he does think John Major's criticism of his boss deserves a little retweet. And he also thinks that it wasn't him that was necessarily tweeting. So, my word, what an eventful week. It's unsurprising that as a result of the week Gitto's just had, that there's some out there who are drawing parallels to a Mr. Anthony Scaramucci. If you all remember, Anthony Scaramucci was this right ring caricature of a Ken doll who was in office at the Trump administration for about roughly 10 days before being unceremoniously booted out. And his reign within the White House started off with a heap of disasters, kind of similar to what we're seeing from Gitto. So do we think he's gonna last the 10 days. Perhaps by the time this airs, we'll have a new comms chief in at number 10. Someone who maybe, I don't know, shops at Aldi rather than Tesco. Someone who is more committed to disco music. To get Aldi, perhaps the only nourishment a new comms chief will need is just the ego of Boris Johnson. Or perhaps they'll feast on the carcass of whatever animal Liz Truss was wearing on her head during her Moscow visit. But for now, let's take a closer look at Gitto. He already formed a Bojo Mance when he was an advisor to Johnson during his stint as London Mayor. Do you remember those times when Boris Johnson was London Mayor? Where we could sit back happily watching him on Have I Got News For You, laughing along with him, comfortable in the knowledge that whilst he may have been fucking up London, at least he wasn't bringing the entire of the British democracy to its knees. Those were the great old days, weren't they? And Gitto was there alongside him during some of his time as Mayor of London, advisor to Boris. But is that a heap of different jobs with a very, very varied sense of principle? He was the BBC's chief political correspondent for a while. He was a presenter on GB News. He was both a staunch critic of Boris Johnson and a nice supportive ally. He is a Remain campaigner. And when he wasn't deciding what side of the fence he was going to sit on today, he spent his time, not necessarily his spare time, because I think he was being paid fairly handsomely for this, lobbying for Huawei on behalf of a PR agency. Fantastic. What a varied and rich tapestry we've got with Guto. And while Guto's dizzying career and strange sense of moral principles might have us into a tailspin, this week long series of gaffes have been extraordinary. And of course, these gaffes have drawn a huge amount of attention from the media, which might not necessarily be a bad thing for the Tories, for the cabinet, for Bojo. Whilst most comms professionals worth their salt will say that a comms pro, a true comms pro, shouldn't really be stepping into the limelight. And I say this acutely aware of the fact that I'm recording a vodcast to attract total attention to myself. It seems that on this occasion, a bit of foreground fuckery from Gutto will help out his fellow colleagues at number 10. It'll take that spotlight off of some pretty creepy moments that are occurring for the organisation and for the Tory party, and perhaps, perhaps, give a bit of opportunity for breathing room whilst they readjust strategy and approach. What's more, Boris Johnson has the opportunity to bollock someone. And as we all know, if Boris Johnson is bollocking someone, whether that's immigrants or poor people or his own comms chief, the people who read The Express on a daily basis engorge with desire. So when you're being considered the most poisonous clown in the room, there's nothing better than to introduce to the public another more ridiculous clown to take the edge off of you just for a little moment. But here's the thing, and this is an admission, there's bits of Gatto's personality or his profile or his approach to the world that I quite like. He's into his mindfulness and his wellness. I think I'm a bit more of a mindfulness guy than I am a wellness guy, given my 17 and a half stone frame, but he's still into it. He meditates for 45 minutes every morning. I quite like that about him. He is a staunch Remainer in the Tory government. I quite like the fact that he's a staunch Remainer. He apparently shares my view that the government over the last few years during the Covid crisis have delivered an absolute masterclass in how to fuck up crisis comp. So in essence, Gitto's 
got us beardy weirdies and hipster oat milk drinking meditators a little bit confused. And maybe that's a really good comms tactic for this government. Perhaps number 10 has decided that to place Gitto alongside this odious individual that we've got in charge of our nation, it adds a little bit of balance. Perhaps Gitto can be this fearless voice of reason where he's both comfortable applauding Boris Johnson's successes Mm. and also brave enough to call him on his bullshit. If that's true, he'll undeniably be doing one thing a lot more than another. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that, to be honest, they're just clutching at straws now. With a similar sort of echo of what happened with Trump, Boris Johnson is kind of looking for the last few people that are prepared to put up with some of this nonsense. And he found an ally in someone who was there with him during some of his weirder moments as London mayor. And in all honesty... I'll expect we'll be waving bye-bye to Mr. Harry fairly soon. So from the story of the week and the appointment of a new comms chief at number 10 to a campaign that was truly admirable, incredibly powerful, and in light of what's just happened, pretty extraordinary timing. The Women's Equality Party launched a campaign that essentially highlighted some disgraceful content coming out of uh, the Met Police's WhatsApp groups, in particular a WhatsApp group that was amongst police officers from Charing Cross Police Station. This was off of the back of a report from the IOPC that highlighted this poisonous culture that was existing and called for an urgent review of what was taking place amongst the comms of people who should be protecting everyone. And it smacked of misogyny and racism and disgrace. And the Women's Equality Party did something utterly, utterly fascinating. They took verbatim conversations from these disgraceful WhatsApp groups and placed them in situ on police-style signage. So it looked at first glance that it was another police appeal sign that unfortunately you see in and around cities and across the country. But when you delved a little bit deeper into the signage, you realised that what was being said was misogynistic, was referring to assault, violence against women. And then it finished on the sign with, if you believe that this shouldn't be happening, phone this number. And that number was to Pretty Patel. There was a nice big question on that signage that said, are you disgusted? If so, please phone. And it signed off with quite a wonderful message that I'll read out, that the police cannot stop violence and discrimination if they do not recognise it in their own ranks. Now, this campaign was picked up across nationals. It was covered in the Huff Post, in the Standard. There were photos being taken of it and shared across social media. And it just had a real profound impact, especially in the backdrop of some pretty hefty fuck-ups on the part of the Met Police. What's more, the way the Women's Equality Party used signage and content, and I suppose design that is familiar to all who have seen police signage in the past, to get their message across was a stroke of genius and actually was a real profound bit of creative. But perhaps what's most remarkable is what happened towards the tail end of this week which is, of course, Cressida Dick, the woman in charge of the Met Police, has decided to step down. Now, I'm not saying that this campaign was aimed at getting Cressida Dick to step down or to resign, and then obviously for the chief of the Met Police to step down and to announce that she will be moving away from the role, albeit when a replacement arrives, you kind of get the sense that this campaign was timed, albeit serendipitously, in a way that really did shine a spotlight on what was occurring. But one of the things that I thought we could take away from this from comms professionals and as creatives is the way in which they actually kind of utilised the content and the creative and the design of the very people that they were pointing a finger at to get the message across. The surprise that was delivered that you were reading something that you didn't realise you were reading, that you were kind of almost being brought in because... Unfortunately, we do look at those signs on a fairly regular basis and find out whether there was an accident that happened, a fatality that took place. And then to see some of the words and some of the text that was alongside that would have shocked the general public into a kind of understanding and perhaps even some action as well. And sometimes this element of shock 
really does work. It wasn't the shock in a grotesque way, but a shock and surprise in the sense that you thought you were engaging with one thing, but then discovered that you're engaging with something completely different. And that's when the penny starts to drop and that the whole of the public is acutely now aware of what is taking place. So in essence, what an extraordinary campaign delivering a really powerful message in a very clever way that shocks and surprises an audience into understanding an issue and into engaging with it. And wow, what a way to end the week. And I guess that brings us to the final closing bit around this uh, week's episode, this week's vodcast. And that's around filling the creative hopper. So a lot of the time people hear this in our industry where we get feedback that's so ambiguous and generic. Feedback quite literally like, let's be more creative, as if I've got a fridge somewhere that's full of creative juice that I can just neck and suddenly become just 87% more creative of my next idea. However, I genuinely believe that some of the greatest campaigns, some of the greatest creative work that we're seeing comes as a result of teams being able to fill their own creative hopper consistently and continually. And yeah, let's take a slice out of Gatto's book. There is a bit of mindfulness around this. There's an element of being really, really deliberate about taking time out every day to actually try and fill that creative hopper. And by that, I mean reading, watching, listening, learning, engaging. And I don't care if you're reading The Economist or you're watching an episode of Love Island. What's important to me is that as a creative, that they make sure that they're constantly fueling their mind with what's happening culturally, try to learn something that they don't understand, try to get a different perspective on a particular topic or issue, and make sure that the topics and the discussions and the content that people are consuming on a daily basis and sharing, we have at least a bit of a snapshot and an understanding for. And so what that means is when that shitty feedback of can we be a bit more creative arrives in your email box what you do is send a probe into your brain and hope that there's something there now if you filled that creative hopper and you've kept it alive and awakened with some info some data points some ideas some concepts some art some beauty in the world perhaps you can use that to develop a nugget of an idea that then turns into a creative concept and ideally a campaign of course if that hopper's empty and all you've been doing is watching Love Island, then the only thing that you're going to have to turn to is that one little bit of content. And so your creative hopper will be unfulfilled, will be stagnant, and you'll ultimately really struggle to create that impact or that powerful in-the-moment creative. So for me, it's not just about sitting in a room with a load of post-it notes and having a good old-fashioned brainstorm. It's about a discipline that you have to exercise on a daily basis. It's about taking the time to fill that creative hopper with things that matter or things that are interesting you, getting a good understanding of that cultural zeitgeist and being able to refer back to those at that moment in time where you need that little bit of inspiration. So that's it for another week. Um, I will try and hopefully keep up pace uh, with the developments in Downing Street and by the time this goes out, who knows? Maybe we'll have an entirely new comms chief, maybe an entirely new government. Perhaps we'll have new police chiefs. We'll have lots to talk about in the next episode. Thank you very much for watching. A big shout out to the Chaos Group for helping produce this fantastic vodcast. And it is fucking fantastic. As always, like, subscribe, comment, do all that wonderful shit. And I will see you next time. Thanks very much for watching. Thank you.